لله رب العالمين محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين أما بعد Now today we'll talk about a lady that all of us would know her name definitely Halim al-Sa'di but maybe we don't know most of her details where is she from where how did she treat Muhammad sallallahu alaihi what happened when Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was there almost 5 years there Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam what happened there and also when Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam became a prophet did she come to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and testify that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or what happened now before we start that we need to say an introduction about something called a rida'ah in Islam which is being a foster mother or a foster father let me just give it an explanation if there are two pairs a husband and a wife okay they have children and for example my child who was born came and was breastfed by the lady of that man during the two years what happens she becomes his mother and the father becomes the father so should, that person would have two mothers and two fathers so my son would have two mothers and two fathers now this son to them will be their their brothers the brother the, the son of them so the daughters and the brothers will be together and to my children he will be also theirs their their brother and also uh, their brother okay now but my children will have nothing to do with them as they don't become brothers and sisters with the other ones they are related through this person through this child but he's they don't have the same status is it understandable i'll make it very clear now if we have khalid for example had married let's say with dad okay khalid and dad had children another one umar married for example amina now umar married amina if amina had children for example and she the children went and had been breastfed by by the other lady with dad for example they become her children as well as also the children of umar and amina now when they are breastfed by her the same thing about the husband he becomes also his father and everything is almost the same in islam she becomes or the children become the children of that person except they don't inherit and they don't carry the the name that's the difference inheritance and carrying the name other than that no they are the same so the only difference is inheritance and carrying the name there's a very subtle riddle in 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 radaa breastfeeding for ladies for example could there be uh someone who's being breastfed by a lady and doesn't have a father in other words his blood father and mother okay but he would have he might have a mother a foster mother but not a foster ha- father logically speaking no but it could happen if according to some ulama the child need to to be breastfed at five times different five times for example one day about five days or five meals let's say complete ones so that child becomes her child but if it's only one day or two days some of the ulama said no now if we say this is just a riddle they say if for example this lady was married to such and such and she had a child from such and such person and now my child is being breastfed twice from her okay and then she got married to another one after of course staying the idda and she had another child from another person and then she was breastfed again my child's been breastfed three times with her 
So two times with the previous husband and three times with that, she becomes the mother, but neither of the husbands would be his father. This is, by the way, this is what they use in some of the fiqh riddles. Now, but when, when, the, when the child becomes the, the, the when the, when just like Muhammad Sallallahu and others, for example, especially in villages, for example, I am the brother of about three, four sisters. They're not blood brothers. But because my mother breastfed them. The same thing with my, my, my older brother. He was breastfed by another lady. In villages, this is, it's ha it happens a lot. That's why it is so important that should be kept and also with honest people. The witness in that, usually a lady. If she comes and said that you are the brother of such and such, and they know that the memory of this lady is, is sound, she's good, they trust her. But but other than that, they may not accept the memory or the witness of a man in that case. They could, but usually it's ladies. Now, in Muhammad Sallallahu case, as the Arabs at that point of time, Mecca, by the way, is the center point of religion and trade at Muhammad Sallallahu time. When Muhammad Sallallahu was born, what happened? To take Muhammad outside Mecca and to teach him and also to give him immunity from diseases because Mecca had a lot of people from different races, from different cultures. They bring with them some diseases as well. So the practice of the Arabs till almost 150 years ago or almost 100 years ago, they used to send their children away from Mecca to an area very close by usually to Al-Taif, which is almost 120 k's from kilometers from, from Mecca. Let me just give you this story and we start talking about this lady radiallahu anha wa ardaha. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after the conquer of Mecca, he was, to be, he was about to be uh, attacked by Hawazan, people from Al-Taif. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa prepared his army to go and attack them before they attacked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in a battle known as the Battle of Hunayn. What happened in that battle? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa won the battle and when he won the battle the Sahaba took the prisoners of war and one lady was shouting how come you take me as a prisoner of war and I am the sister of your own leader? And they said who will be the sister of our, re of our leader? She was shouting and shouting and they said, okay, we'll take you to our leader, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then she said to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of course, we would say that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew her, but he said, she said, I am your sister. I am the daughter of Halim. <coughs> and then he said, what is the proof that you are my sister? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is asking her because this is logical. Not everyone could claim anything and we just believe. It's like sometimes Muslims get very stupid. If anyone believes that he is a wali, people just come and shake him and worship him almost. Well, this is not, this is an absurd thing to happen. Now, this lady when she claims she is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's sister, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what is the proof? She said, I was taking care of you one day and you had bitten me. He had bitten her. Muhammad did bite her. And then Muhammad smiled and he said, yes, that's right. She became believer. Radiallahu anha wa arda. And Muhammad gave her the choice whether to be with Muhammad or to go back with, with the family of her family. That's why all the prisoners of war, by the way, of Hawazin, after the battle, they were free. They were freed because they said, we can't just take the relatives of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi So they freed all of them. Now, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi of course, first, his mother, of course, breastfed him. Amina. And then, 
the first to take care of him after his mother was Umm Ayman Baraka who talked about this lady radiallahu anha wa ardaha was a slave girl to his father then to his mother then to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but then after his mother there was Thuwaybah the slave girl of Abu Lahab Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's uncle when Abu Lahab knew that this lady breastfed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he was so happy of the birth of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that's Abu Lahab by the way he was very happy then when he knew that 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 Thuwaybah actually breastfed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said you are free he set her free she's not anymore a slave now it was reported Al Abbas was saying this he said after the, the battle of Badr uh, I saw Abu Lahab Al Abbas of course the brother of Abu Lahab Muhammad Sallallahu other uncle and then he said I saw him and I asked him what happened to you he said I seen him in a very bad situation and he said I, when I asked him what happened to you he said everything is bad except on Mondays and Thursdays there will be some sort of milk coming from the thing between the index finger and the thumb I suckle it it's because I let Thuwaybah breastfed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is for Abu Lahab and he was the uncle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the way now when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of course was born and as we said this is a practice of the Arabs Ibn Ishaq was telling us about the story of now of Halim al Sadiya. and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the way did tell also the story of Halim al Sadiya. When a man came to him and asked him, What is the proof that you, the son of Abdul Muttalib? Of course, they called him by their great grandfathers, Abdul Muttalib. His father is Abdullah. What are you claiming? Is it true that you're claiming to be a prophet? And then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I'll tell you the story. He didn't say yes or no at the beginning. Then he told, he told him the story where he was transferred from his mother to Halima. And then what happened with when he was with Halima and then returned back and he told him everything about his story Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then he told him what is Islam at the end of it this man embraced Islam I'll tell you the story at the end if we have time now Halima her name is Halima bint Abi Dhuayb her father's name is Abdullah bin Harith she's from Hawazin from, from At-Ta'if At-Ta'if is almost 120 kilometers from Mecca she said we, me and my husband, her husband is Al Harith ibn Abdul Uzza from the same tribe, and others, almost ten ladies. They, we, we came to Mecca. Now she said, when we came to Mecca, we wanted to, because it was very drought, and we wanted to find one of the kids that we could take, one of the infants, especially for the two years, that we could take care of breastfeed and we could take some money from their fathers now she said I had a camel very weak in other narrations she said I have a very very I had a very very weak donkey she said we started to look for children and we started to look for the children Abu Talib Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Abdul Muttalib Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's grandfather he said she knocked at the door he said what's your name she said Halima and then he said where are you from she said I'm Halima Sa'diya and Halima by the way means patient patience and Sa'diya means happiness then he said that is very amazing patience and happiness that's good it's a good ornament it's a good fortune it's a good sign of fortune then when she learned that he was an orphan because his father died before his birth she said well we were not going to take him now she almost declined and then she started to look for another house to take a child she said we couldn't find anyone and then after a while she said 
my fellow ladies almost took their children with them it's only me and my husband we don't have anyone now and then she suggested to the husband something she said it's not good really to go back without anything why don't we go and take the orphan and subhanallah suggestions such such those things for, for example if you are going in a place and then someone might suggest why don't we go for example and pray in the mosque or why don't we go up for example and uh, visit one of the brothers instead of going to a place which may be not a good place subhanallah good suggestions do come from good people or from those who have some good inclination within them that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give it to those who have some sort of inclination inside when you have that inclination Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the tawfiq the success to be guided to the right thing subhanallah sometimes you see evil things in front of you and if you are by yourself you want it actually to do them but subhanallah when they are in front of you you don't want to do them why? because of your good deeds that you've been doing in the past maybe because, because of one prayer that you said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's been accepted and when it's been moved away from you you say subhanallah al-azim alhamdulillah that's moved away from me you don't know why and if you come back to your senses you say wallahi alhamdulillah that Allah moved it away from me but if it happened to me now I'm not going to refuse it wallahi subhanallah this happens to almost all of us something bad in front of your eyes don't name just like name anything in your mind of an evil thing and then subhanallah into your mind say no not now and then when you refuse it subhanallah Allah makes you hate it then when you go by yourself sometimes shaitan comes back to you and say why didn't you do it and even sometimes if you go and chase it you want it you don't find it or sometimes when you want to do an evil thing there would be someone with you who wouldn't be happy with it so you just become shy of doing it I say well life it's that person wasn't with me so this is by the way from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's tawfiq that Allah is guiding you because of either a prayer of your, of your parents or someone or yourself or of your good deeds by the way now this lady she said she suggested this and a suggestion that changed everything for her it wasn't just like a normal suggestion whether we go to such and such restaurant or such and such restaurant almost similar but she suggested something more then the husband said why not okay let's go that's why it is very important by the way my brothers and sisters when you do something especially of good make sure that the ones around you are supporters of good and stoppers of evil because if they are the opposite if they are supporters of evil whatever good you suggest they refuse it and whatever, whatever bad you suggest they will accept it so if they are good they will support it now the man supported her his wife and she said, he said to her, okay, why don't we go? Now, she went back to the family. She decided to take Muhammad sallallahu Now, when she took Muhammad sallallahu that's what she's saying, by the way. When she took Muhammad sallallahu the donkey or the camel was very weak. It was the last one. They, they sometimes will, 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 will tease her and say, your, your own donkey or your own camel is very weak. Why did you come with us? And she was, she said, I was so hungry. You don't have anything. There's not no milk in my in my breast. She said. So and also the drought that they have. That they had at that point of time in their houses, in their villages, in their country, is so much so that all of their kittles, all of their sheep almost very very fragile very weak see that the moment I took Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa it's only days sallallahu alayhi wa 
The moment she took Muhammad Sallallahu everything changed. She said, when I gave him my breast, he started to breastfeed. And it's just like, there is something. She said, I could know that there is, it's not something that from me, but from somewhere I don't know. And she said, this is the first blessing that I felt of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then, when they were going back, the ride that she had on this camel or, or donkey, let's say the camel, because there is a different, different relations, different relations. She said, my camel is almost unstoppable, very fast. It, it was at the back, but now we're just at the front. They say to me, wait for us. Don't run. What happened to your camel? She said, Wallahi, I don't know. Now, this is the beginning of the blessings that happened to, the, to this great lady, radiallahu anha wa anha. And then she said, when I came home, she had also other children. Of course, because if, if, if a lady would have milk in her breast, that means she had also other children. Now, she said, it wasn't enough for one child. But subhanallah, when my other children came, they were able to also be breastfed and suckle, and milk would come for them. And then, she said, the night that we slept, that night after taking Muhammad Sallallahu it wasn't far away of course from Mecca, it was 120. She said, the night that we slept, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi with us, it was the best of our nights. We didn't feel like anything with the things before we feel. And then, the husband said to Halima, she said, Halima, he said, Halima, Wallahi inni, لأراك قد أخذت نسمة مباركة. He said to her, حليمة, I think you take a, you took a blessing. That was from from the first night, by the way. And it was a blessing. Now, and then he said, don't you see what happened to us from the night that we took Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم? Don't you see the blessings around us? And then he continued to say, and this blessing will continue. Of course, by the way, they slept halfway before they come to their own village. And it was very fast, the, 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 the camel that, that she rode. Now, when they arrived to their families back home, Halima Saadiyah had this child. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The others, of course, had their own. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the blessing could be filled. Now, wherever the kettles, the sheep, the camels of Halima Saadiyah would go, it would be green, and they could graze and come back full. They, they, they filled it, and it comes sometimes when you have the blessings becomes so normal to you, then you don't count it. Now at the beginning, Halima felt it, and she was counting on it, sallallahu anha, and then it becomes very normal. Just like for the new Muslims. The first day, subhanAllah, this is the first week, something of a change. And then after that, what happened? It becomes very normal. That's why, when you see your faith not increasing with any people, leave them. When you see your faith decreasing, you're going low, leave them. Don't stay with them. Because our faith would go up and down, it depends with whom we are. With the good people, it is just like when you play soccer. If you play with a good team, you'll be playing good. When you play with a bad team, you just will play bad. It is very logical anyway. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam companions, because Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is charging them with the faith every now and then, what happened to them? From few people, they're just few people. But what happened? Their faith increased and increased and they with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
the Muslim Empire expanded so much. Now, as Muslims, born Muslims, we don't feel the real blessings of it. If we do feel the real blessings of Islam, Wallahi would be thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night, not missing any prayers. Because it is a blessing to be a Muslim. How do we think how do we know that? Sometimes we think How do we know that? It's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Logically, you say, Subhanallah, alhamdulillah that I don't I don't worship a statue. And you say, those who worship a statue, I don't know how do they worship a statue. Because your logic, your faith is making you straight. But maybe if you get used to worshipping statues and those who worship statues, maybe one day you will worship it. But when you, are, when you are with those who are reading the Quran, praying, elevating yourself, you see a higher status. That's why one of the Sahaba said, Wallahi, during the days of the Tabi'een, those after the Sahaba, he said, now you are doing things during Muhammad's time we thought they are major sins, but I don't even care about them. For example, if nowadays, the one who prays Fajr on time, oh, that's, uh, that's just, mashaAllah, that's, that's a sheikh. While it should be, everyone is praying Fajr on time. Especially if you're a Muslim, this is the default, to pray Fajr on time. Those who don't pray Fajr on time, they're actually, mm, we don't know. It is just like, if you are, if you are, if you are at the university, okay, the normal way is to be, it is to be at your classes before the start of it. That's the normal way. But if you become late or don't show up, there's something wrong with you. The same thing with prayers. It becomes for us the opposite. If you are good and excellent, you pray on time. Well, if you are actually normal, you pray on time. If you do the extras, that's the good thing. Those who come to university and come on time, everything on time, okay. But now what judges that is your own attendance and your own prayers. How does it affect your own behaviors? That's the judgment. The same thing you attend at the university, your classes, does that attend affect your own grades or not? If it doesn't, you're bad. If it does, you're good. Same thing with the prayers. If they do, it's good. If they don't, there's something wrong with it. You need to fix it. Now this lady, radiallahu anha, as we said, Muhammad blessings started to, to be seen to everyone. Now all the, those around Halima said, whenever you see the, the kettles, the sheep, the camels, the donkeys of Halima is going, follow them. Just graze with them. Let, let, let our sheep graze with them. And so whenever they would go, that means it is a good area to, to live your, your camels there. Now, when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stayed there almost after two years, of course, two years is when the, the sun, especially now in Islam, the sun is to, you stop him from breast, from being, from being breastfed after two years. You do your best to stop before so they get trained. Now, she was talking about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of course, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at these two years, how was he growing Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Halim al Sadiya said, I saw him growing twice as any normal one. In his intellect, in his shape Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she said, he, he doesn't look like other children Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He wasn't like them. And then, she, she almost said she lo he looks like a man. Even he was almost at two years old. He looks like a different, a very tough man. She said one day, my son, the Qurashi, they called Muhammad and 
my other sons were playing and when they were playing she said played two men came and took Muhammad Sallallahu while he was playing with the children when they took Muhammad Sallallahu behind a tree they stayed with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so what do you think the children should do they went running to their mothers Halima Sadiya and also her husband to tell what happened to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now when they came they saw Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's face they saw him standing and his face is pale Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was narrating the story he said two angels came to me and when they came to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they opened his chest an operation without or with anesthesia this is now a miracle they took his heart out Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cleaned it any heart will have an inclination towards evil but not Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's heart they took it and cleaned it so there is no inclination towards any sort of any evil very clean the basin was a golden one the water was the water of Zamzam they cleaned it they put it back it was almost a complete operation in matters of seconds now when when the family came Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said I could see these two men one of them helped me to stand up and I thought that people could see them but no one saw them they didn't talk about these two it was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by himself looking at them and his face was pale Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said my mother Halima came and hugged me and I could see them in there but it seems to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that no one is actually look, could, could see them except Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said my uh, my father came and saw me and then they saw they thought that something happened to me what happened during those days by the way it was also narrated that when this happened to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam during those days they will take the person to an oracle a magician now when they took they they spoke with him with Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam anything happened to you? He said no. Asking questions they said no. The man said, the husband said, well he, he sounds alright, there's nothing wrong with him. But Halima insisted. He said we should take him. Maybe something wrong happens to him, we don't know. Now she took him to a very well known oracle who tells the future. When he saw Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then he spoke with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he said, he spoke with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because Muhammad doesn't worship the idols, the whole tribe worship the idols. And he hates the idols, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was very young, just like a few years, almost four years, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the oracle said to them, the magician told them, he said, this young person, when he becomes a man, he will rebuke and insult your gods. And he will bring a new religion. So kill me and kill him. Don't let him. And Halima Sahriya said, Wallahi, we thought that, that this, the boy is insane. You are insane. You are the crazy one. We, we will, not, will not kill our child. And he will not kill you. If you want to kill, kill yourself. And they left him. Now, to, to this incident... By the way, this, is a, this story is not mentioned in many, many of the books of the seerah that they did go to, to this oracle. Another story happened that his uh, uncle, Abu Talib, or his grand, uh, grandfather, took him to one of the oracles and he, he was, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wasn't there. He took him and they stayed for a while. Then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left. But when the oracle said, where is the child? Muhammad already left. Then he said, this child will have a future. And Abu Talib himself knew that Muhammad had a future. Now what did, 
What did they do after that? They were afraid that something happened. She said, I was afraid. Me and my husband were afraid that something would happen to Muhammad Zazad. And of course, if something happened, what happens? They will blame her and blame her husband. So she said, we, after almost two months, we couldn't, but we took Muhammad Sallallahu back. Before, by the way, before this incident, after two years, what happened? Muhammad Sallallahu after two years, is to come back and visit his mother. He visited his mother, and his mother said, we want him to stay. They begged his mother, they said, why? we want him to stay with us, please. They started to tell his mother, it's good for him, Mecca is not good for a child like this, he could get be affected by, by, by diseases, etc. It's not good even for his tongue, etc. They, they tried to, to, to convince his mother to get him back after two years old. Now they took him, but then after this incident, they were afraid. They came back to, 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 to Amina. When they came back to Amina, they said to Amina, well, we're, we are returning him. Then she said, what happened? Is there anything wrong happened to him? They said, well, we're afraid that something might happen to him. Now, when they, uh, they told her the story, she said that he could be affected by satans, by devils, by demons, by any bad things. She said, no. Wallahi. And his mother was just like all the other families worshipping idols. She said, Wallahi, my son, there's nothing will harm him. You know, the, the disbelievers, those polytheists worshipped the idols of Mecca. They knew that Muhammad sallallahu said nothing could harm him. His mother said that. And then she said, when I was pregnant of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi I saw in my dream that a light was going from outside me. This light could be, I could see the palaces of Asham, which is Damascus. When he was out of me, this, the, the, the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and then she said when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went down she gave him, gave birth to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam she said he came depending on his, his hands Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam anyway to say he is or he isn't well she said that now and then he, she said his head was up to the sky of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then she said don't even think of this nothing will harm my child she had that steady belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not harm, that nothing will harm Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, they said she took him for a while and then returned back to his mother when he was six years old sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, when, when this opening of the chest happened to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it happened to him, by the way, two times. Once, when he was four years old, the other one when he was fifty years old. Just before the Isra and Mi'raj, Jibreel came to him, opened his heart, because in the Isra and Mi'raj he will see things that it doesn't a human being's heart cannot really resist it. It needs someone's heart, it needs a heart that is different from other human beings. What happened? Jibreel took Muhammad's heart and fill it with wisdom, faith, and then put it back. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi on this journey of Isra and Mi'raj, as Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta-A'la talked about, أَلَمْ نَشْرَحْ لَكَ صَدْرَكَ Don't we open your heart. It's in the Quran. Some others would say, especially the Muslims, will try to make things very logical. Well, it wasn't. It was actually a metaphorical way. Well, when we say metaphorical way, and everything we talk about metaphors, then Muhammad is just like any normal human beings. That's what is the trap is. Muhammad had miracles, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Muhammad did have miracles, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the least, the least of them, 
the least for us to say there are many many miracles of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. For example, Qal Ayyad al Shifa mentioned almost about a thousand of the miracles of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. These miracles was done by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. By which help? By the help of whom? Who? The magicians? Allah subhanahu wa taala. So the one who created the laws is whom? Allah subhanahu wa taala. And the miracle is breaking the law. That's, that's what a miracle is. If you see someone, for example, telling you that now an incident happened in Yaguna, let's say. And you say, well, that's a miracle that you told us about an incident happened in Yaguna. Well, if it happened in the past and there are some people knowing about it, it's not a miracle anymore. There could be someone telling you and you don't know. But if I say to you that something will happen in the future and it's according to the law of physics, for example if I say to you, now, if you turn the light it will turn off. Well, that's very logical. But if I say to you, if at, the, at 9 o'clock someone will come and turn the lights, Logically, you say, well, there's an appointment between you, you and him. Okay. Try to use your logic, especially with people when they talk about miracles and they talk about karamat, etc., etc. With Muhammad, وسلم, he had many, many miracles. And the miracle is good for the person. For a prophet, the miracle is good for the prophet himself and for the people to believe in Muhammad. But if a man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala awali a miracle happened to him it's for the wali himself not for anyone of or anyone else okay now Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa did have miracles now Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he talked about himself when he's telling us about this story he said when these two angels came one of them said after finishing operation they said, he was four years old, they said, let's weigh Muhammad وسلم, with one of his ummah, one of his nation. Muhammad overweighed him. He said, about 10. Then Muhammad overweighed him. How about 1,000? Muhammad overweighed him. And then the other angel said, Wallahi, if you put all of his ummah, he will overweigh him. Muhammad وسلم. The weight of faith, by the way, is not how much do you weigh, as Muhammad Sallallahu said, in the Day of Judgment. The fattest person would come and he will not wait in the sight of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala and Adam. And there will be the slimmest person who is coming and in the sight of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, it would be heavier than the mountains. So, your faith is actually your weight. It's not how do you, how do you, how, how, how heavy you are. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he was of course uh, was asked by the Sahaba how did you know that you are a prophet? because spending many many years with Halim al-Sa'diya and being there and educated with those Arabs, Bedouins especially because when Halim al-Sa'diya came to take Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam she, she looked like a Bedouin the narration said it was a Bedouin lady coming to pick Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, how did Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam know that he's a prophet from an early stages of life? Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he was asked Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, radiyallahu anhu, he said to him, Abu Dhar, to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, how did you know that you are to be a prophet? He said, one day, I was woken up by two angels. And they were talking about me. He said, I was woken by their talks. One of them said, is this the man? He said, yes, he is the man. He said, are you sure this is the man that we're looking for? He said, yes, this is the man we're looking for, the prophet. He said, now this is the prophet to come, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he talks about weighing him with his ummah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, Muhammad وسلم, became a prophet at the age of 40 and then at the age of 50 وسلم, 
Isra and Miraj happened to him. At the age of 53, he moved to Medina. When he moved to Medina, by the way, we need to mention some of his brothers. For example, Hamza is what? His uncle. At the same time, he is his brother. Because they were breastfed by Halima. Hamza was breastfed by Halima. So he becomes his brother. Also, Abu Salama. Abu Salama, Abdul Uzza, who was breastfed by Thuwaybah. And Thuwaybah also breastfed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith, he was also breastfed by Halima. He also Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's brother. Abdullah and Anisa and Hudhafa, as well as the Shayma, they are also the sons of Halima al-Sa'diyya. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had brothers. Not from as blood brothers, but they are from because they were breastfed by Halima radiallahu anha. In the conquer of Mecca, if we say, we said, uh, 53, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam moved to Medina. And then, just before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's death, almost a year and a half, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conquered Mecca, or two years. And then after that, the, the, he moved and, 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 and the people of Hawazin were about to attack Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam attacked. And then a lady came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They said, it's just like, this is a Bedouin lady coming to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw her, she's now in her own 90s. When he saw her, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came to her and put his, uh, the carpet or rug under her. And then the other man, her husband, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa put another rug under him. And then the Sahaba so who's, who are these two? Then one of them said, this is his father and this is his mother. This is Halima and this is her husband. The Sahaba saw that the respect Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa had for these two is just something that have, they haven't seen. They haven't seen Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa treating others like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa treating these two. And of course we could imagine that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was visiting them sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's no explicit narrations, but we would say Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi character will tell us that he is actually visiting them. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, of course, this tells us how Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi did dealt with his parents. And then Halima moved into Medina. She stayed in Medina. Of course, dealing with Halima is dealing with whom? With Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi mother. That's why Muhammad Sallallahu respect to Halima is part of our religion. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala said in Surah Al-Isra, "Wa qada rabbuka alla ta'budu illa iyyah wa bil walidayni ihsan." Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala is commanding us to worship him and to be good to our parents. Subhanallah. If a person is so nice and so good to everything and to everybody but bad to the parents, that person may not be saved from hellfire. May not be saved from hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Do not say to them, Oof. Do not say, Oof. Let alone rejecting them or rejecting what they ask you to do. That's why one of the Sahaba said to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, What would be the limits? He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, If they struggle against you to make a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't do that. Other than that, yes. Of course, not a disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, the person would have two gates to paradise. The mother and the father. If one of them closed, don't let the other one close. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was praying with them, making khutbah on the member. And he said, Ameen. 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 Then the Sahaba said to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Why are you saying Ameen? He said, Jibreel came to me. He's, and he said to me, That if a person 
his two parents or his parents are alive but they did not his manners to them and his respect to them did not lead him to paradise he will be in paradise in hellfire in other words if you're not treating your parents good there's no paradise one of the sahaba of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he was about to die Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sahabi about to die and his mother is there Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is there and the sahaba said to him say la ilaha illallah he couldn't he said I can't say la ilaha illallah he said I couldn't say la ilaha illallah he said I couldn't they, they came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to, to tell Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa what's happening Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said does he have any parent living he said yes his mother he said go and ask her is she pleased with him or not they went and asked the mother. She said, I'm not pleased with him. Then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, okay. That's the cause. He couldn't say, La ilaha illallah. Tell her to, make, to be pleased with him. She said, no. I'm not pleased with him. Then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to the Sahaba, gather some wood. For what? He said, we will light a fire. Then light a fire. And then the mother said, for what? Muhammad said, we will burn him in this life, so in the hereafter he wouldn't be burned. And she said, why? He said, well, if you're not satisfied and happy with him, hellfire will be, of course, will be, he will be there. And she said, no, I'm satisfied. I'm very happy with him. Then Muhammad said, you sure? Because sometimes you say something, to make others please, not from the heart. Of course, she said yes. Then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, now go and he will, he, will, he will have said it now. The Sahaba said he said it and then he died. He said, La ilaha illallah, before his death. Because the first, the, if the last word was La ilaha illallah, and the person died, the person goes to paradise, as Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. Now Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam set an example with with his mother he, she was his foster mother how many unfortunately the Muslims with their real mothers Wallahi I've seen someone who's treating his mother and he was a Muslim and some people look at him as a good man and I said subhanallah I couldn't really stop I said how, how dare you talk to your mother like this he said what I said if you're talking to someone else from the, from the streets, you wouldn't be talking like that. He said, but she did. I said, if she did what she did, you can't do anything. You cannot say anything. You cannot utter words that make her angry. Let alone you yourself, you're, 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 you're the one who's doing the mistake. And he was shouting at his parents. And I said, subhanAllah, why are you doing this? He said, you don't understand, Zaid. I said, la ilaha illallah. I can't stay in a house like this. Shouting at your parents, I can't. This is, it's a major sin to do that. Shouting. Of course, if they ask you to do something and you don't do it, it's a major sin. Of course, it shouldn't be a disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was recommending the Sahaba, he said to them, as Umm Salim mentioned that Umm Ayman radiallahu anha or Umm Salim mentioned that also obey your parents because obeying them is almost leading you to paradise why would the family be, will be destroyed if the parents said something and the child said no what happened a rebellion inside the house what happened to the society there's no society, there's no respect to each other. So what happened? It's very easy to get agitated, to go and rampage and to go and do something against someone. So what happened? Society will be an evil society. That is why Islam is concentrating more and more in the family, especially the parents. Because dealing with them educates you. Dealing with them trains you. 
listening to them gives you an experience from the past if it's good you benefit if, if it's bad you try to avoid because not all parents are the same by the way even if the parent, if the parent is very bad you shouldn't do anything wrong to them you should be very very tolerant to them one story of a parent I can't, I can't forgive this story sometimes there would be examples of, of parents who are very bad that no one could really resist to tell their stories and sometimes it would be so bad so that it would be just like generations carrying that bad one person who was married subhanallah after his marriage his wife kept nagging him about his father his father is very old almost deaf he said okay what should I do with him she said just kick him somewhere they were living in a village and near the village there is a forest almost a desert there's no one there and he said okay he took a carpet just a rug with him and some food carried his father inside the jungle put the carpet placed his father and left while he was leaving his father was speechless cried the tears coming down he couldn't cry and he said why are you crying he said why Allah you're much nicer than me he said why he said I did the same thing for my father I didn't even put a carpet under him I didn't put anything under him just put him on the ground without anything without any food without anything and then he said to him expect that from your own child doing something nice to your own parents is almost a debt it will be repaid for you repaid for you in different ways if, you're, if you are good to your parents it could be in any ways in the success that you have in your life in the money that you have in the everything good that you have maybe in your family in your children you don't know one of the brothers came to me and he was very nice to his own uh, parents and he said to me he came crying up and he said to me people are talking about me and people are saying this and this about me and he said to him why just you why do you mention the, the, the bad thing why don't you mention the good thing I said isn't your wife Mahajaba he said yes he said wallahi she prays at the night she wakes me up for Fajr she is this and she is that and she reads the Quran almost daily she's a good lady and I said how about your daughter she, he said the same thing about her and I said just tell me something if I curse you the whole day or your own daughter is somewhere you don't know what is easier for you he said if you curse me the whole day but if I don't know where is my daughter that's very bad I can't live with that I said subhanallah we forget about the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it becomes so much so becomes norms and customs we don't even take them as a credit as a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was of course looking after this lady as she is his mother sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and another one also that he was looking after was Ummu Ayman and he used to tell her Ya Umma, oh my mother Umm Ayman was a slave girl she was a slave girl married to Zayd bin Haritha but Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to treat her also as his mother now when Halima Sa'diya moved to Medina they said she stayed in Medina for a while whether she died from Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's death or she died after Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's death they said she died in Medina and buried in Baqir may Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala accept our deeds and may Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala make us of those who do the good deeds and follow it with a good deed Allahumma afir lana wa rahamna wa afina wa afa'anna wa akinu nuzlana ya Rabbil Alameen wa ja'alna min al-barina fi ahlina ya Rabbil Alameen في أمهاتنا وآبائنا وجميع من له حق علينا يا رب العالمين اللهم 
واكتب لنا في هذه الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة واجعلنا من الصادقين يا رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا